make a distinction between what is called secularization and secularism. Uh, secularization is the term introduced by the sociologist Max Weber, and he, he uh, wrote a lot about it theoretically. And secularization is very distinct. Uh, it's very distinct from secularism. Uh, Secularization is the name of a cultural and uh, cognitive process in which, which was described by different rhetoric. So there's the death of God, which really means loss of belief in God, and the decline of magic and ritual. That's another rhetoric in which secularization has been described, which means uh, basically the loss of religious practices and cultural habits. So diet, um, dress, um, it, it, if one gets rid of uh, the cultural habit of wearing a parda, that's a bit of secularization, but it has nothing to do with secularism. If one, there's a loss of belief in God, that's a uh, a symptom of secularization, but it's not got nothing to do with secularism. Because you can be very unsecularized, you can be a very devout person, and you can be committed to secularism. Uh, in fact, uh, because secularism is not... So secularization is the name for a process of loss of belief and a loss of practices uh, of, uh, around religion. But a secularism is the name of a doctrine which, uh, which is much more specific and restricted, uh, where it, the idea merely is to, to uh, steer religion relatively clear of the polity. Where how clear and exactly what way clear, those are things to be uh, uh, specified and and uh, argued about and so on, but it's a very specific doctrine, which is to, to steer religion relatively outside the orbit of the state and of the polity. Uh, and, and you can believe that religion should be relatively removed from the polity, and yet be a completely devout person. I would say that most of my family is, uh, is not very secularized. Many members of my family are not very secularized, but they are impeccably secular, secularist. So, uh, so that's a distinction. Uh, to, and and uh, so if we keep that, in, so, and for instance, America, especially the heartland of America, is not at all secularized. There's tremendous uh, cultural uh, and cognitive commitment to religious tenets and practices. But America is a secularist country. Uh, and so, uh, now there, there were countries like uh, Turkey, for instance, under Kamal Atatürk, which were very self-consciously not only secularist, but also secularized. I mean, uh, the Kamalist idea was to, to get religion even out of the uh, 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 public civil society, not leave alone the politics. Uh, so, uh, and, the, and the Soviet Union, uh, for instance, and communist countries generally, uh, were, were both secularized and secularist, uh, but not America at all. Um, Europe, Western Europe especially, is, is both secularized. Uh, the, the church going has very steeply fallen, uh, and it is secularist as well, most for the most part, uh, in fact, entirely, uh, except for nominal elements, say, in Britain. Uh, so that's one distinction to, to keep in mind. Um, 
But now you wanted to talk about in India nationalism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the what is the link? Uh, what is the link to um, uh, secularism? Yeah. Okay. In the Indian context. Okay. Well, you you see the thing is that there's a great tendency in in Indian academics to to keep redefining the term terms generally terms in in politics. Um, as if they should be indigenized. And, and I think that Gandhi's instinct on this was much more uh, plausible, which is to say, so Gandhi's view, at least in the first 30 years, uh, say, of the freedom struggle, was to say, no, I'm not going to redefine secularism so that it comes out in some Indian form. I'm just going to say, there's no reason for India to be secularist. <coughs> and I think that is a, a much more tr truthful and, and plausible way of, of looking both at the concept of secularism and about the Indian historical context. So, so let's just go back and look at how secularism as a concept emerged in the first place. Um, there is no doubt that secularism is a term that emerged in the modern period in the West, in Europe. And, and I think it's, it's completely wrong, as many have tried to do, including Amartya Sen and so on, to say, well, there was secularism in Ashoka's reign and in, in medieval Andalusia and in Mughal India and so on. I think that is just conflating different things. And there's no reason why all good things should be the same good thing. Uh, there were good things in those, uh, in those times, but they were not secularism. Secularism emerged in the modern period in <coughs> Europe. <coughs> and it had a very specific trajectory. And, and I'll try and explain that. In a, uh, so I'll, this will take a, just a little bit of time. But I'll, right. You see, Sometime in the late, after the Westphalian peace in Europe, uh, there was, as a result of the new sciences, which, which began to infiltrate into the zeitgeist, old ways of justifying state power uh, lapsed. In, in times prior to, to uh, modernity, uh, state power was justified by the divine right of the monarch who personified the state. Uh, sometime in the late 17th century, basically after, uh, as it happened coincidentally, <coughs> after the Westphalian uh, peace, that, that way of, of uh, justifying the state's power uh, could not be taken seriously anymore. So, uh, new forms of legitimizing the state were sought. And this was done uh, primarily by introducing a, a justification from, from political psychology rather than theology. And the idea was to create a feeling in the populace, not directly for the state, but for a new kind of entity that was emerging at that time in Europe since Westphalia, which later on came to be called the nation. And the, this new kind of entity and the state were existentially fused. They were inseparable from each other. You could not understand the state as it was emerging then, which was an increasingly centralized state, which was integrating different, uh, scattered locations of power into increasing centralization. 
in that kind of state was fused inseparably, undecouplably from this new entity that was emerging, which was the nation. In fact, that inseparability was defined by or identified with a hyphen. And, and you, when you called it the nation state or nation dash state, <coughs> the idea was that you couldn't understand either without the other. It just simply, they, they, they didn't have an independent uh, existence in, uh, uh, in one's understanding. And so, justification for state power was generated by generating a feeling, not directly for the state, but for this thing called the nation, which was inseparably un understood from the state. Later on, this, this feeling came to be called nationalism. But, but uh, I mean, that's just a matter of the rhetoric as it emerged later. And everywhere in Europe, this uh, form of justification, which was to create a feeling for what was on the left of the hyphen, and thereby legitimizing the power that's exercised by what's on the right of the hyphen over the people who had that feeling for them. And, and I think everywhere in Europe, this feeling was generated by a very well understood strategy, which had its, its sort of uh, culmination, hideous culmination, in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. But in fact, that method of generating a feeling had, had been deployed centuries earlier. In fact, all over Europe, nation-building exercises took the form of, of finding an external enemy within the territory of this new entity and calling and, and treating them as something to be despised and subjugated and <clears throat> setting them up as the other so that the, uh, as them, so that the nation could be ours. This was a standard way of building the idea of a nation all over West, post westphalian Europe. The Jews, the Irish, the Protestants in Catholic countries, the Catholics in Protestant countries, this was the standard method of doing it. Later, when numerical and statistical forms of discourse were introduced into the study of society, this you constructed notions like majority and minority, and this strategy came to be called majoritarianism. And when the majoritarianism was religious, which it very often was, it took this particular form, nation building took the form of religious majoritarianism, justifying state power through these methods that I'm describing. And when this became quite, uh, you know, a lot of damage was created. Part of the damage was that there began to be minoritarian backlashes against this uh, majoritarianism, right? religious minoritarian backlashes. And, and when that happened, uh, I think there was a general feeling that even though the problem began with majoritarianism, religious majoritarianism, the real problem could only be addressed by addressing religion itself because the minority backlash was also quite creating a lot of civil strife. And so the feeling was that you couldn't stop the civil strife unless religion was taken out of the orbit of the state and steered into what they call civil society or personal life and so on. That's the origin of secularism. That whole history is the origin of the idea of secularism. Now, in India, People like Gandhi, and especially Gandhi, but Nehru too. You, you know, it's remarkable. But they, in, in Nehru, whom we sort of identify as Mr. Secularism, uh, the fact is that from the time he arrived from South Africa till pretty much the early 40s, Nehru hardly spoke of secularism. It was just not part of the, the vocabulary at all. Uh, and the reason for this is, is that Gandhi especially, but also Nehru, said, we've never tried to build a nation along those lines, along the European lines. I mean, this, this method of creating uh, a feeling for 
the nation is just not part of our, our culture or our history. So the idea of secularism, which is there to repair the damage done by that sort of majoritarianism and the minority and backlash to it, just simply had no application in, in you know, throughout the freedom struggle. Uh, and if you read the discovery of India, even, I mean, Gandhi was very explicit about this, but if you read the, the discovery of India, basically citing Gandhi's views, Nehru repeatedly says, India's culture and history was marked by a completely unselfconscious pluralism. And so you didn't need a self-conscious imposition of something like secularism at all. Okay. Now, what is true is that people like Savarkar, etc., wanted India to follow the European path of nation building. To find an in internal enemy and, and despise them, and so on. But this was not part of the national movement. The national movement had wanted to create nationalism was exactly the opposite of European nationalism. Right? Which you did not proceed by by excluding the minorities or despising them, but in fact including them. The Khilafat movement was a movement which openly declared itself, attached itself to an obscure Muslim cause by the lights of ordinary uh, uh, Muslims here. And, and it was a way of including Muslims. The Muslim mass contact program all the way down in the late 30s, it was in 1937-38, uh, openly said they wanted to contact the Muslim masses, they were not afraid to say we want to just include uh, the minorities. So it was precisely the opposite of, of nation building exercises of, of Europe. And, and so my, my own, in the analysis that you mentioned in the talk I gave, my own view is that because so nationalism was a, in, in the hands of Gandhi, at least as an ideal, the idea was to, to represent the pluralism of Indian culture, the past and present, in the political arena as a form of anti-imperialism. And secularism, therefore, played no role in the rhetoric of Indian nationalism, particularly. Now, occasionally it did surface, and it, when it surfaced, it was targeting the Mahasabhite elements in the Congress and the Savarkar's ideology, and, you know, uh, and so when those things cropped up, the term secularism emerged. But by and large, Gandhi and Nehru's view was, this is not part of our culture. There may be a few people, uh, uh, Mahasabhite figures and, and Savarkar and so on, but they haven't. They, now, by the time we come to the 1980s, the late 1980s and so on, then, you know, I think that kind of majoritarianism, which, which was the basis of European nation, it's basically Europe which, which had that nationalism. We never had it until the late 90s, 80s, and then, and now we know that we just are, are landed with that kind of, of uh, European form of nation building and nationalism. And now, more than ever, secularism, as it was understood by Europe, is relevant here now today. Hello, yeah. Uh, th this is uh, quite an interesting um, uh, trajectory, I must secularism and uh, it's linked to nationalism. Uh, while you say that in Europe uh, the context was to actually eject uh, religion uh, uh, from uh, uh, the state. Uh, yes, to, to repair a certain damage a certain that's created by their version of nationalism. Yeah, by their word. But in both stances, I, in Europe and in India, it was directed at forming a nation, a forming of a feeling, vis-a-vis -vis an enemy. That's in Europe. Yeah, yeah. even in India, the well, enemy well, was, was not, uh, Britain, not, Britain, isn't it? No, in now, India, why were we reconstituting the nation in India if it were not to fight an anti-imperialist mm. battle? So it had to be an all-inclusive mm. anti-imperialist battle and it had to be inclusive in terms of the number of religions, number of communities, and identities that we've had. And so give a stamp of legitimacy to all the communities, to all the identities and the religion that were existing. And by reconstituting them, 
bringing them together as a nation to fight the British. The point I'm trying to make is uh, that in both instances there was an enemy, yeah. a need for an enemy, but in that instance the need for an enemy, uh, the, the texture of nationalism and feeling was different Whereas in India, the texture of nationalism and secularism was different because the contexts were different. Yeah, but I want to mildly protest your expression, the need for an enemy, to describe anti imperialism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the need for an enemy, there was the fact of an enemy. All right, okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm, I stand corrected. I mean, the, the, certainly the enemy was already there. Yes. 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 Whereas they were actually constructing, constructing an enemy in an Europe. Enemy. Sure. 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 I, I think uh, uh, that po point is well taken. But then you jump to the contemporary secularism, which is now practiced, say, in 80s. In a sense, I think one will have to look at what you mean by secularism before we go into your drawing a parallel between the secularism. As it is perceived in today in contemporary yeah. politics, with what it was in Europe, you know that connection I think is very important. But before that, if you could elaborate on what you exactly meant by secularism, uh, yeah. that that is very very important. Yeah, I, I think that is very important. You know, because it's I mean it's a it's a very curious thing. You find people that in fact somebody whom I respect a lot, a, a, a political uh, theorist, Arthur Chatterjee, he says, <coughs> so, so you see, my view is that since the late 1980s, <coughs> uh, the Savarkar ideology has basically had its victory in, in this country. And uh, by the way, it's, it, it, the BJP is... is uh, of course, it's most uh, sort of vivid manifestation. But in fact, I think Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi had begun to introduce those majoritarian elements uh, uh, against the Sikhs and, and when it suited their electoral purposes against the Muslims as well. But of course, uh, uh, the BJP could do it with, with much more honesty uh, and not in a manipulative way. Uh, but but you see, what I don't understand is that many political theorists like Chatterjee and others are saying now that that people, and maybe some of you can explain this to me because I, I really find it completely off beam and I just don't, don't really even get what's the motivation for saying it. But there are people like Chatterjee and others who are saying that these Hindutva ideologues today are describing Indian nationalists of the past and, and their legacy as pseudo secularist And they're saying that if you, since they're charging these people with pseudo secularism, they themselves must in some sense believe in secularism. Okay. So, so they're basically saying the Hindutva people are in fact secularists, so maybe we should try and change the subject to something else because they no, I just don't understand I don't even understand what they mean. I mean why is it why does it follow from the fact that somebody calls that X calls Y a pseudo secularist that X must therefore be implicitly committing herself to secularism. Why? I mean it's it's a bit like saying if I say something is a fake unicorn, I must believe that there are unicorns. But that's an absurd inference. Right? So, so I mean, if, if X says of Y, you're a pseudo-secularist, he may be saying, you're not living up to secularism as defined by your lights. That doesn't mean your lights are my lights. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's such a numbingly gross fallacy that I... So there may be something I'm not getting. Uh, it just sounds stupid to me. Uh, so here you have, it's very important then to say, what is secularism? And the term secularism emerged with, in very concrete ways 
after independence, when legal processes were introduced to, uh, to bring about reforms having to do with religion. You see, the British Crown had begun to introduce reforms of religion really since 1858 on a whole range of, of uh, uh, matters having to do with criminal and civil law. But as we know, uh, uh, they left family and personal law aside. And, and it's in, in, in the post-independence period, mostly under Nehru's, uh, almost entirely under Nehru's personal influence and weight, the Hindu Code Bill was introduced. I mean, everybody was vehemently opposed to it. Rajendra Prashad and Pant and Sandan and people like that. <clears throat> and Nehru, through sh sheer personal popularity, pushed it through against tremendous opposition, even within his party. And, and when he did that, he, he was tapping a European notion of secularism. And that is the only notion of secularism. So I don't believe we should fiddle with the concept of secularism and say there is an Indian version of it. Everybody is doing that. Radhakrishnan said that, Amar saying that, and a whole range of people who follow them in this. I think secularism has a history, and a definition of a term should keep faith with that history. Otherwise, it becomes arbitrary and irrelevant. Uh, so, so here is. So some people say secularism in India is a neutrality between religions. I don't believe that anything of the kind. Secularism, I mean, this, people often say that, and we have to explain why they said that. But, but when Nehru introduced the term secularism in, in discussions, by the way, it's not, it's not introduced into the Constitution till the 42nd Amendment, which happened in 1976. So, so, but it was there in the discussions during the reform of the Hindu Code Bill in 1955. And the idea was very straightforward. It's just the idea of European secularism. And the, the idea is that there are some constitutional principles, often described as rights, which don't mention religion and they don't mention opposition to religion. They're just neutral. And this, so that I would say there are three aspects to secularism, which is the European idea, and it was exactly how it was introduced into the, the reforms of, of uh, the mid 50s. And the idea is you start off with two commitments. One is to freedom of religion. People are allowed to practice their own religion without interference. A second commitment is to Principles enshrined in the Constitution, often described in the vocabulary of rights, which mention ideals that do not themselves mention religion or opposition to religion. So it could be free speech, it could be gender equality, and so on. And so you've got these two commitments, the freedom of religion and these rights, let's call them all. And this idea of secularism is that when you have these two commitments, which you should have, and there's a clash between them, then there is what economists uh, call, or ma and mathematicians call, a lexicographical ordering, such that if there's a clash between them, the principles which, mention, which don't mention religion or opposition to religion always come, get placed first. Right? The religious practices always get placed second. So the principles always trump the religious practices if there's a clash between them. If there's no clash between them, you can have as much religious practice even in the public domain. It's only when it clashes with principles that are neutral between religion and opposition to religion that you place the latter first. And the, the notion of a lexicographical ordering is basically comes from dictionaries, you know, the alphabetical ordering of dictionaries.
slight digression. I mean, because um, uh, when I was in, uh, chairing the National Commission for Child Rights in Delhi, uh, the National Commission for Protection of Children's Rights, uh -huh. uh, there was a case that came to us about uh, young children being converted as monks, as Jain and Buddhist monks, as a complaint. And uh, I didn't know about the lexicographic ordering, but uh, I wrote a letter to the Maharashtra chief minister saying that if there is a conflict between children's rights and tradition, culture and religion, children's rights takes precedence over tradition, culture, religion, no matter what, even if it hurts the religious sentiments, that is not as important as this. And uh, it caused a slight furor in Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. It got quoted in the newspapers. I'm glad that what I said was right when I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just an uh, uh, aside. It's a, it's a digression from the yeah. core discussion that's, that we are having. That's, that's exactly right. And that's exactly the idea that mm -hmm. Nehru floated when he introduced, when, when the parliamentarians introduced this code bill in 55. Uh, why, while you do uh, discuss, uh, uh, you know, the Indian constitution uh, and that uh, it maintained uh, core principles, uh, is there over time a dilution over core principles at the political sphere, uh, especially when we look at the kinds of politics of communalism that is occurring? and uh, the communal rioting that is going on. And each time there is a riot, say for example, there was a riot in uh, Bombay, the next riot would be bigger than the riot that was in Bombay. Now there's Godra, the next riot in Muzaffarnagar is bigger than the Godra. So in a way, is that contrary to the core principles of the constitution when the state does not act on it? Yeah, sure. uh, And And, and uh, so if that is so, and I just want you to link it back to the majoritarian communalism that is emerging yeah. uh, 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 and the state's uh, complicits uh, about it, no matter which party is governing. And do you think it is linked to, uh, uh, what is it linked to, the political economy? Are there structural factors that it is linked to? Uh, is it linked to the corporate uh, sector wanting to see that certain core called uh, labor standards or rights uh, are not guaranteed to make their business. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but can you just tell me why is this trend growing and there is a complacence of any political party to take a very strong stance against violence due to religious, uh, of religious nature. So how would you respond to that? And then the nature of secularism that is being practiced today. Well, I mean, you know, these, there's, there's nothing that, that I have to say that others haven't, many others haven't said uh, about what makes a lot of these religious uh, sort of feelings arise in public life and, and politics. A lot of it has to do with the manipulations of, of states. Um, uh, you know, people, I was just uh, uh, reading things on Kashmir, for instance, and um, a lot of, uh, I mean, everybody is quite rightly uh, critical of, of the BJP. It goes without saying that it's a disgrace what's been going on. Um, and and many people here have, have uh, said it and written uh, uh, with anger and, and uh, uh, dismay about it all. But you know, we, uh, while we are, uh, we might as well say things uh, that this audience doesn't uh, want to hear, maybe. Uh, we all want to hear a criticism of the BJP, so that's good. But, but we also should be uh, critical of, of the Congress. Uh, the jihadi elements in Kashmir were created by the Indian Army. Uh, they, they were created by the JKLF was a very powerful opposition in Kashmir, and in order to to divide the opposition, our government and our army uh, encouraged the jihadis. This is documented. 
and uh, and this should be, uh, you know, uh, people should say it. Uh, uh, criticism of the G BJP in this kind of audience is is what we all know, and and we uh, we all want to hear it. But we should also say uh, that a lot of the communal elements were created, uh, say in Kashmir, by, and this is this is a has happened everywhere. The, the Israel created the, the Hezbollah. America has created the ISIS elements. In perfectly well known, actually, that um, uh, America created uh, Osama bin Laden and the jihadis in the uh, Mujahideen element to overthrow the Soviet presence in the uh, in Afghanistan. So this is just a standard ploy. And but you're you're right that a lot of Hindu fundamentalism and uh, in in politics has emerged. And I think it's it's uh, it's a complicated thing to analyze, but it, a lot of it has to do with neoliberal e political economy, which um, which depends on uh, uh, processes in which the forms of uh, uh, mobilization, uh, especially in in the countryside, where people are dispossessed of their land and they have no other politics to turn to. Except the identity politics of religion, and and I think this is very much a result of the impover of the immiseration of people in the countryside because of the disposition that comes with these ordinances and so on. So a lot of identity politics gets created, uh, which which uh, is entirely a result of there being no other politics that they could turn to, uh, uh, given the Immiseration. So, somebody ought to really do a careful analysis of the links between this form of political economy and and you know there's there's one thing I really would like to to get uh, to know from what uh, from the audience and you. I've been reading about this Garvapsi uh, uh, phenomenon, which is. Uh, uh, which you can't open a newspaper without reading about now. And here's something I don't understand. Of course, what is obvious about it is how manipulative it is, these forms of co co uh, conversion. But what I'd like to, to understand and probe is something which may be, but I could be wrong, so, so let's uh, discuss it, is, which may dig deeper, with, uh, and, and that is, what is the notion of ghar here? The wapsi part we are all, of course, you know, feel is it's it's a manipulation of people to to convert and so on, uh, and that's familiar. That's the familiar uh, routine form of of uh, majoritarianism. But the deep mistake seems to be that there is an assumption that there is a home to which they should come. What is that home? I mean, this is a religion which has is defined by exclusionariness in caste, anyway. And if you take something like Sanskrit, you know, which is which is a linguistic uh, core of the kinds of purity of, of caste and so on, you think of Sanskrit. My colleague, a, a very learned man, Sheldon Pollock talks of Sanskrit cosmopolitan. Um, it's a very interesting, you know, very fine work. Um, yet I don't understand what a Sanskrit cosmopolitan could be. I mean, he may, he may have a very specific idea of it. He does. But, but I would have thought prima facie, here is a language which almost every other language we know of in India has translated Sanskrit texts into into these various other languages. Sanskrit has never translated any language into it. So how is a culture and a language which has never taken anything else into it in the name of you know high Hinduism or purity, how is it a home for anything? What notion of a ghar is this? So of course the manipulativeness of these conversions is one thing. But the very idea is absurd. It's, it's historically and, and conceptually and culturally just false. Yeah, uh, I, I think this is something so open that uh, uh, 
uh, on on impeachment, which is primarily, but I just one last uh, uh, comment from your uh, talk. Also mentioned about internal democracy within religion mm. and the failure of democratization within religions uh, and communities. Now, I don't know if I understood you uh, correctly, but I would rather uh, think of democratization based on an area, because an area is inclusive of all communities, all classes, all religions, all identities, and then consensus on issues. Yeah. And that would seem to be seen a very logical process of democratization. But when you talk about democratization, because I suppose you had also mentioned about how politics gets imposed on communities where they have no say in what religion is, what they're defining religion about. Uh, I, I, I find I am not able to accept that I am not able to immediately give you a reason for why I am unable to accept something like democratization of religion. I yeah. rather uh, go by a very conventional way of understanding democracy which is based on an area mm. and where it includes everyone into forming a consensus because if one is talking about democratization of religion then where do you draw a line? Because I also see religion not as a monolith, that subgroups and subsects and subsects and subsects. At what level do you define where you have to be democratic in that framework? So uh, this is something that I have not been able to understand. It could be done outside or here, I don't know. But I just thought that I would end on this note because this is the only that when you spoke about, I was not able, I was not convinced. Mm. And I have been to Northeast a couple of times. I have been to Pokraja and uh, to uh, Iran. I have been to North Kachar Hill. There are about say, 70 kind of ethnic groups over ground and the same ethnic groups staying underground. And uh, there is an ethnic ethnicity and politics with only some hundred for number of populations. They form a group and therefore talking about democratization and that has played such a divisive role that nothing seems to reach out to anybody in, in that sense. So I just wanted to know what you meant by this and after that I would go uh, open uh, 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 I mean, I think we had a very good, uh, uh, to me it was an exceptionally good conversation. And if you would like to uh, say something more which you think you would like to communicate to the audience, then open for the audience. Okay, now I, I don't know how you got the impression that I believe that religion should be democratized. But let me give you a sense of what, why I introduced the term into discussion. Uh, you see, everybody says, including George Bush, uh, has said that things like uh, most Muslims are not uh, extremists or fundamentalists. It's just a small fragment of them. And uh, Well, if George Bush says something nice about Muslims, must be true because uh, so uh, and <clears throat> but this is widely said about <clears throat> all um, religions that the extremists among them are a fragment of them a small fragment a fraction of them okay well if that's true then there's an undiagnosed phenomenon uh, which is how is it that so often this unrepresentative fragment within religions gets to give the impression that it's the representative voice of the religion and gets and the whole religion gets tarnished by their activities and so on. Well, this is something we need to diagnose. How does this happen repeatedly? Right? And 
all sorts of things go into explaining it. One is that the media pays most attention to people who make the loudest noise and have the shrillest voice. Okay. The state responds to what the media puts into the air because they think that's what's having the most effect in people's minds. So there's a whole range of things which which underlie the diagnosis for why unrepresentative voices get to be seen as the representative voices. Now, if that's right, then a natural thought, whether right or wrong, that a natural thought is that if you can democratize the group, the whole what is what is the point of democracy? The procedural point of democracy is to calibrate representation with numbers. Right? The larger the numbers, the larger the representation. Okay. So, if the problem has been that a small unrepresentative group gets to be representative, there's a failure of democracy. So, all I said was that if, if democratization of religious groups was possible, then it may be the case that one could show that this is a small and unrepresentative minority. But the trouble is that there isn't any way to set up representative institutions within communities. We have elections and representative assemblies and so on at the federal or national level. We have them at the state or regional level. We have them at the district level. We have them at the municipal level. But what would it be to have democratic representative institutions for a community. The communities are dispersed all over. I mean, you have, some, you have something like the Parsi Panchayat. The Parsi Panchayat, you know, which is actually sort of an absurd body, but, but it, it, the very fact that there is such a thing is only because it's a very small group and it's not scattered all over the country. It's in a relatively small, you know, located place. So, so it's impossible. So all I said, I think, was that if there could be democratization, then this problem could be dealt with, but it's, it's just not possible to do it. That's the, that's the only reason why I brought it up. Um, we now open uh, this for questions. Yes. Good evening, sir. I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. And for the sake of me, maybe a little more clarity, I'd like to ask a question for myself. Uh, if at all, if you say that, is there an Indian notion of a concept of secularism which is different from the West? Uh, in the sense, we, we try to handle the diversity instead of uh, steamrolling and marginalizing the minorities. Is there such a concept, uh, a viable concept or a well-defined concept existed? Uh, or if it existed, we failed in the practicing the concept. Um, the problem or the, the, the division of opinion or the, the conflict has come because it was never really practiced. Everybody wanted to try to use the, violated it. And therefore, we have competitive. Because um, <clears throat> um, why I'm asking this question is, once I heard Rajiv Bhargava saying that Indian, notion, Indian concept of secularism is totally different. Try to maintain critical distance from all religions. That was the essence of Indian secularism in the sense that it did not really push away the religion, nor it hugged the religion, but it intervened whenever there is a necessary on constitutional and democratic. For example, if caste Hindus, are, uh, if lower caste Hindus are not allowed into temples, then courts and state did intervene so that the religion is democratized and, and so on. But whether that was um, effectively, uh, whether that was practiced for all religions, for example, in Shabanu case, could it do it? Um, or in, uh, in other cases, could it do it? 
வருது 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 ஸோ த நோஷன் ஆஃப் த கான்செப்ட் ஆஃப் இந்தியன் சிக்கலரிசம் ஈவன் இட் எக்ஸிஸ்டட் வாஸ் இட் பிராக்டிஸ்ட் ஆன் சீரியஸ் couple of more questions yes yes please jaswin i am a little confused by this whole notion of democratization of religion i mean are we referring to demo- democracy between different religions or are we referring to democracy within a religion yeah and if that's the case then i think there's a fundamental logical flaw because the concept of religion and which includes the concept of the divine or the god etc and the others and the devotees and the devout is inherently undemocratic for example i mean i can never become god only god can be god and um, so i i think that's really <laughs> confusing the issue i think that's that's an untenable uh, proposition so i don't think any kind of uh, like you know um, um hopes of that to be achieved should be entertained once we are religious yes hey i'm interested in your discussion of gandhi and nehru you talked about um so secularism according to them was an antidote to majoritarianism and since india did not have any conscious or unconscious majoritarianism they felt that there's no need for secularism um but what so they argued that we have a conscious pluralism as you said as opposed to majoritarianism but what's the justification for this type of claim because somebody like savarkar would just as well argue that well no this is wrong we actually have an unconscious majoritarianism and i am just giving a conscious voice uh, to this unconscious yeah instinct that's already there so yeah how, how do you you seem to agree with the nehru gandhi's uh, argument why are they right uh, what's the justification and then how did we somehow transition from from this state of unconscious pluralism to well what we have today which is somehow different it seems more in the unconscious majoritarianism side yeah yes. I, I, i i think uh, after two questions and then his response we go to you have very well in secularism as it was in europe in a very highly academic way what we are faced with in india at the moment mainly is how to check communalism how to prevent people of different faiths of different religions from clashing against each other and being at log ahead with each other so here in india perhaps in a practical way by the word secularism we would mean some way of bringing about harmony and at least adjustment and peace between people belonging to different religions and faith number 1 number 2 what i have always been saying is that if the state or the government in india or any country cannot con- can it even hope to control and check majority communalism sir about an instance the imam shahi imam of the delhi jama masjid gave a rather very angry and violent speech some lawyer in kerala filed a case in the court that what this man said was against the law in such and such section of the indian penal code the magistrate in kerala issued a summon which the kerala police about three or four members of the kerala police came to delhi but they were unable to serve it on the imam who is there all the time because the delhi police refused to cooperate then the magistrate issued a warrant over him and 
seven members of the Kerala police went to Delhi. They wanted to arrest the Imam, Shahi Imam, and bring him to the court in Kerala. There he could have got bail for it. The Delhi police refused to cooperate with them because about 10,000 people collected and started shouting slogans that Imam Saab cannot be arrested. And the government yielded to them, submitted to them. Some people were very happy. See how powerful our Imam is, how powerful we are, we can prevent him from doing it. I said the government which cannot arrest the Imam Shahi he may be of the Jama Masjid of Delhi, how on earth that can that government ever be able to take any action against a person like Baal Tagre, or against the RSS, or against a more powerful communal element. What we are faced in India today is not so much the theory of secularism, or the history of secularism, or the academic um, meaning of secularism. What we are faced here today with is how to let our country live homogeneously, peacefully with each other and go ahead in life. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to yeah. uh, respond and then we'll take yeah. other questions. Right. I'm afraid you won't pay attention when I say it that uh, that now more than ever, we have to respond to just what you said. And now more than ever, we need to appeal to the European notion of secularism. Deal with it. Uh, so let me link your question, which is a slightly point-missing question, with the question that you raised at the back, which, which I think is something that ought to be addressed. It's a very important question. And... And, and that is that, you see, it's what, what you want to point out was that what he is talking about really had a history which goes back to, to Savarkar and, and the Mahasabhite element, even within the Congress. Well, you know, here is something that, that's very important, what, what you, you raised, and I was actually just discussing it last night with my brother. See, it's you have to try and un you have to understand that from the time of the pact in, in the, of the, the uh, League Congress Pact in 1916 till independence, this was the most fantastically creative period in Indian history. Every kind of view surfaced in these 30 odd years, 35 years. It was the most tremendously creative turmoil. And, you know, you, you can't understand how important it is that a country should go through this form in the public sphere, go through a kind of mobilization, not just of people, but of ideas and ideologies. And what is remarkable is that, of course, every kind of ideology surfaced. You know, Savarkar said what he said. The Mahasabhite element was present. But what Nehru and Gandhi succeeded in doing, I believe, literally all the way till the, the mid-80s. But, you know, you can... Uh, of course there were exceptions to this trajectory. Of course the, all sorts of things, other things surfaced. That's what it is to say it was a creative period. The, so, of course, you know, Savarkar had a say and so on, but it was not the mainstream of the movement simply was not. Gandhi and Nehru held out hope for this kind of inclusive nation hidden nationalism. Now, one of the, the remarkable things is that you might think that the separatist politics of people like Jinnah was a response to people like Savarkar. It was not. What Jinnah was most made anxious by was the inclusive nationalism which mobilized the Muslim masses. That's what made Jinnah anxious. Jinnah represented a careerist, urban, educated, middle, middle class Muslim. That's what Jinnah represented. He was made anxious by the mobilizations 
of the Congress under Nehru and Gandhi, who were speaking directly to ordinary Muslims, the mass of Muslims. That's what created the separatist politics, not an anxiety about Sabarkar. He may have said that, that, that the Congress really will uh, go over to Sabarkar, but what he was made anxious was by something else. And it, I think it was honorable and noble of the Congress to, to, uh, to unleash a kind of mobilization that included the mass of ordinary Muslims as much as anybody else. Now, you're so my view is that the kind of thing you're talking about it surfaces, but it surfaces in our time. And in our time, there is no way, I'm saying, to address it except to adopt the kind of relatively rigid secularism, not this nonsensical idea that has been quoted. It's not Rajiv Bhargav's idea. It's, some, it's Radha Krishnan's idea, and Amartya Sen said it too, that it's an equidistance be, between different religions and so on. It's nothing of the kind. You, it's, it's, it's what I was calling... A, I'm sorry that you thought it was academic. It's a perfectly plain idea. The plain idea is that certain rights are basic, and if there's a clash between religious practices and it, whether in the matter of temple entry or in the matter of child labor or, uh, or in the matter of, of uh, uh, free speech and blasphemy laws and so on, if there is a clash of this kind, religious practices must be placed second. And if you were to implement that with any uh, uh, seriousness and, and uh, consistency, you would be able to address this problem. You haven't done it for reasons that have to be analyzed. We, we spoke a little bit about how you should analyze and diagnose it, but secularism is secularism. It, you can't just adapt it and mean whatever you like. You can introduce neutrality between religions as a, sec, as a sort of side constraint on what I'm calling was the only concept of secularism which was introduced in order to reform the law. Now, there was no equidistance between religions when it came to Muslim personal law. That didn't mean you overturned the idea of this uh, uh, secularism which placed rights over religious practices. You, you, all you said was, that, I mean, this is explicit in the Constitution. You simply haven't listened, uh, people haven't read the Constitution or, or listened to the elaborate Constituent Assembly debates in which what was said was, ye Muslimaan unki zamindari gai, unki Urdu, you know, you, I mean, just think of what happened to Urdu, right? Uh, uh, in a fit of nationalistic peak, this language was given over to Pakistan and its widespread availability in instruction and in schools and so on, where you didn't have to go to anything special to learn Urdu. You could learn it all over the north of this country. Uh, this was uh, slowly undermined, but thanks to people like Sampurnand and Kandan. UP was the main battleground. This is where it happened but also for the rest of North India after that. All these things are, uh, uh, so, so what was said was, they've lost their zamindari, they've lost their language, they've lost their numbers in programs on this side of the border, there were programs on both sides of the border, they've lost uh, so much of their population to, uh, after partition, let us give them their personal laws because it would be too much to take it from them. That doesn't mean you've changed the notion of secularism, you've just said we will apply the only notion of secularism there is at a later time when they are ready for it. That's what they said. They said it explicitly in the Constitution. The, the clause about uh, uh, uniform civil code is when they are ready, we will give them a chance to be ready. We'll give it to them for now as an exception because of all these losses. This is perfectly plain. It's absurd to say that they're putting aside an even handedness. They gave this, maybe but they were wrong. In fact, my own view is, if they had given them their language and availability of Urdu all over the country in the way that existed in the past, they would have had a much more powerful tool, their own language, than to have these laws for which everybody despises them. So maybe that was a mistake, but it has nothing to do, it makes no difference to the notion of secularism. There's no reason to define the notion of secularism, redefine it. You don't make something that has got a perfectly good meaning something indigenous. You just say it is relevant at some times, it's not relevant at other times, but it, keep the term, the uniform meaning it has. Thank you. I think this has really given us a great clarity on secularism uh, and, and also the uh, background to personal laws, you know, and why Muslim personal law 
uh, which is again i think very very important and also that uh, one had not raised the issue of urdu language and why must urdu language be a language only for muslims it was a language for all uh, you know and in in this very state hyderabad state it was spoken by all it didn't, it was a very secular language and now it's become a language for pakistani muslims alone so which which is very sad anyway any more questions one sir after savarkar and especially after 1947 until 1972 there was no communalism there was a lull of communism for 30 years 30 long years don't you think that mrs gandhi policy of appeasement from the day, uh, day uh, she took over as prime minister and she escalated that appeasement and bringing the 42nd amendment this was the root cause for the emergence of the hindu fringe element that was the uh, at that because there was a three decade lull and later on this, uh, why they are called pseudo seculars i mean you, you said you didn't understand why they are called pseudo seculars only because why uh, why they are pseudo because they are only appeasing muslims for vote bank politics and a third uh, dimension to it is since four five decades funds coming from america missionary funds to convert and so many people have been converted all these three factors triggered this fringe groups to emerge yeah well you know i do think that you're absolutely right that there was something of a fault line be- which began with indira gandhi you know there was this whole gharibi hatao stuff it was of course just a complete smoke screen i mean and first of all it was a completely empty slogan what does gharibi hatao mean as if anybody can fight on the mandate of retaining poverty uh, but but when the whole slogan and its that campaign was just getting nowhere i think uh, the government that government began to appeal to majoritarian elements in uh, in in order to to win votes uh, and it and it's not just the muslims the sikhs were very much targeted too <clears throat> but you see what i mean my own instinctive understanding and diagnosis here is and i could be wrong maybe you some of you will correct me if i'm wrong but i feel that a lot of the rise of the hindu right in this country in that period was during the emergency we just have to admit that the hindu right was much more courageous in opposing it than the left and a good deal of the rise of the right was because they were got the moral high ground during the emergency and the left i mean the left in kerala and bengal and you know a few people were but by the the, the cpi and the and the delhi sent you know the the, the high command of the left were like dormants uh during the emergency and they lost the moral high ground and the right but the hindu right particularly did show a lot of courage d- during the emergency and, and opposed it and they did win a moral high ground and it's since so that that can't be left out of of uh, accounting for their rise there are all sorts of other elements that account for their rise a lot of it has to do with issues of political economy as well yes yeah, sir uh, coming to the politicians and religion every politician starts his campaign with a temple or a church or a mosque what he says is i believe in your hanuman you believe in your hanuman if i lose hanuman loses so vote for me there is a kind of emotional blackmail going on related to a religion so we all know this is not correct but what is the solution for this according to you well i i don't have a blueprint for it.
Yeah, sorry, uh, very quick. I'll be very quick about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I just wanted to push you on that point about co constitutional choices that uh, general liberties must prevail over religious liberties. Uh, so you've already addressed the broader principle, but another compromise of sorts was, of course, the guarantee for uh, some autonomy given to religious and linguistic minorities for running education and cultural institutions. Uh, some people, of course, said that it was motivated by comparative development, international law, similar language in, in its documents being negotiated at the time. Uh, the specific debate, of course, was about the preservation of language and culture for the numerical minority. And subsequently, the courts, of course, messed it up further by allowing, let's say, professional education and commercial education also, be, also to come under the ambit of that protection. So where would you locate that in your current discussion? Because at the moment, we have this huge controversy about the right to education statute that mandates, let's say, the apportionment of a quarter of incoming seats in primary schools for economically weaker sections. But the courts have also left out uh, religious minority schools from that ambit. So, I mean, though it could, of course, be situated as a simplistic debate between majoritarian and minority groups, but there's also a broader social justice question which comes about there, which is why I think it's slightly different from the Muslim personal law example. Yeah, but you see, you can't leave out the fact that, I mean, if you, uh, it's not as if the Muslim personal law question is, is irrelevant here because, I mean, what we've got to, to face up to, I think, is that uh, if there is a clash of, uh, see, whether it's language or it's personal law, the general point is that there is no commitment to the idea that you make the Muslims, say the minorities generally, an exception in the name of minority rights. I'm not, I'm saying that that's not a part of how the Constitution and modern Indian history, post-independence Indian history, thinks of the exceptions that the Muslims were given. I'm denying that the exceptions should be understood as a way of elaborating the notion of minority rights. I, what I'm insisting is that it should be understood as a very specific concession at a very specific historical conjuncture because of the losses that Muslims faced in the post-partition period. I mean, it's, uh, and, and, and this is continuous with the, the kinds of things I was responding to with the, with the excellent question that was raised about Sabar Kinra. See, you, I believe a lot of the fault line lies with the kind of separatist politics that were, uh, that was the minoritarian backlash. That's really, I think, uh, uh, was a panic created by a certain form of mass mobilization of Muslims. And that was, uh, it was, a, uh, I mean, you, you have to compare somebody like Jinnah with Azad to understand what, what that issue was about. And, and, I, and if, you, if you understand it along those lines, it really does seem to me that you, you've got to, to see the Constitution and the parliamentarians of that time giving the exception, not by saying we are going to create an enclave of minorities who will have the right to their culture no matter what their culture, uh, how it stands vis-a-vis -vis the, the other principles that the Constitution is committed to. That's not the basis on which the exceptions were given. The exceptions were given speaking to a specific set of losses that the minorities ha had suffered and seeing them as, in, as historical subjects who will overcome the losses if they get the confidence and so on and so forth through the post-independence period. Now, as it happens in the post-independence period, just read what the Satcha report says, they are worse than they ever were. So there's no reason, and that's why I keep saying, now you have to enforce secularism in just the way it was done in Europe. You have to, you, you have to take a firm stand uh, against this uh, current government, and the only way to do it is to implement secularism in the strongest possible traditional sense that it's always had in Europe. Uh, I was uh, most uh, intrigued by uh, uh, proposal that the the need for secularism, the pure secularism. Uh, occurs, I mean, 
is there in today's times but i was also intrigued by the uh, that indian nationalism was a formation and uh, resisted religious consolidation in a sense or consolidation on the majoritarian sense uh, if we look at it that way then how do we think of pune pact pune pact in which uh, gandhi sought to neutralize the uh, major from uh, so think the pune pact how do we look at it in retrospect yeah well that's a uh, I've never said I've never really spoken about Gandhi and nationalism without the caste question coming up, and uh, and of course it's a it's a very fraught question now, especially with uh, you know I I'm not going to be able to defend Gandhi on on his on the caste politics, especially of in the 1920s during the uh, but I, even if you're highly critical of him, you've got to understand what his view was. it may have been very naive but his view was that uh he was i mean he always said that he was committed to a uh, caste but he also openly said that what he meant by caste was he understood caste to be indian forms of heterogeneity and not hierarchy and that's a very naive view because caste is not merely heterogeneity but he had in mind some earlier uh, version of it when he thought all hierarchization within of caste was a corruption of of what he meant by pluralization a plural, pluralism and heterogeneity and you know you've got to you I mean, there's just no denying it gandhi was a religious man and gandhi was a lot like burke was in europe he was completely consistent so was burke you know if you take somebody like burke we know and admire burke because he opposed imperialism right but we also know that like gandhi burke was extremely conservative say on the french revolution he was conservative for just the reasons gandhi was but but burke was completely consistent he gave the same argument for opposing imperialism and we admire him for it that he gave for opposing the french revolution for which we don't admire him so it's we who are con- inconsistent he was completely consistent his argument was the same argument to oppose the one and the other and the argument was you don't just go and upturn an existing civilization whether it's done by an imperial state or whether it's done by a rev- revolutionary mobilization as in europe you just don't go and upturn an existing state you have to have very good reasons to overturn what's given to people over centuries now this is re- a kind of religious conservatism and but was actually anglo irish in that respect so so all i'm saying is I'm, i can't defend all of this in gandhi but he was consistent about this this is what he believed it was completely naive but but you you see i mean here are these people who are i, I mean i don't want to defend gandhi's caste politics it was extremely problematic <clears throat> but here are people who have been going around saying about him that he uh, the sort of thing if you just compare him to ambedkar look at what ambedkar said about the adivasis did gandhi ever say anything as racist as that about any caste he had problematic caste politics when it came to particular uh, exercises like the uh, uh, pune pact but did he have these attitudes of of hatred and, and superiority about a whole people like ambedkar had about the adivasis i mean it, 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 so we all appeal to to great thinkers and activists selectively we take from them what we, what is worthwhile and if you're honest you say this was naive that was problematic etc we do that with ambedkar i don't think i think ambedkar was a very great leader and and a great constitutional thinker but he had tremendous flaws i've, I've just mentioned the, the worst of them it, it, it's just the way of of intellectual and political life that you are selective in the way you 
take from people and you develop ideas and, and, and uh, theories of your own. But uh, that's what I do. And, and it would be dishonest of Arundhati Roy or anybody else. Who, uh, by the way, I greatly admire Arundhati Roy. She's one of my heroes. She's a woman of great courage. Um, but on, on this, I think she's just not fair to, uh, to Gandhi. And, it, it, and she admits that, that uh, 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 Ambedkar has these flaws. But, and so Gandhi had his flaws too. We, it's, we just have to do what we what we can with, with the intellectual past in, in presenting our own views and thinking about the, the, the present and the future. Um, the, the problem today, um, what, what you suggested that we implement secularism and its true meaning, uh, which you described. The issue uh, here, the main hurdle here is, uh, A, the political will, which is totally absent. And in fact, it is contrary to um, any notions or any desire to, uh, to establish uh, secularism in its true sense which is again backed by a substantial majority of uh, the citizens and which it draws it seems to draw its power from. Uh, so there is an issue of execution of uh, a desire to establish secularism, but that is one part of it. Uh, how would you react to what happened in Paris uh, yesterday? Was it a failure of uh, just the law and order machinery? Who happened there? Paris. 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 Yeah. Yesterday. Uh, and today. Uh, the murder of the cartoonist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, was it a failure of uh, plain law and order machinery or intelligence? Or is there an issue with the way uh, France itself has adopted secularism and implemented it? And so has uh, other parts of the Western uh, developed world. Yeah. How would you react to that? Well, you see... Uh, Europe has a set of issues which are relatively distinct from the kinds of issues we've been talking about here. A lot of European... Uh, you can't understand what's been going on in Europe in the last few decades without understanding a history that goes back to the reconstruction of European nations after the Second World War. Those nations were reconstructed by a very familiar method. You see, there was a lot loss of a lot of manpower due to two wars in the 20th century, two great wars in the 20th century. So, so a great deal of invited immigration took place in those countries from erstwhile colonies. And and when those people came and settled and brought families over generations over there, it created some of the same issues that were created by colonialism itself. That is, you found a subject people, not now over distant overseas lands, or, uh, but within your own land. But the same set of, sort of quasi-colonial relations uh, had emerged, and all the racialist attitudes and so on were present there. And, and I think a whole range of issues that a new name was created for this, because which is secularism was in fact seen as a, as a way of not recognizing these immigrant populations and their culture. So a term called multiculturalism was introduced. The term multiculturalism is almost entirely geared to problems of immigration in Western lands from us to our colonies. And, and I think the question you're asking is not about secularism, but really about the successes and failures of multiculturalism. And that's a problem of, of really European colonial racism being replayed inside. Uh, so it's a slightly different set of problems than this Hindu-Muslim circle. Yeah, so Mike Runner will ask the last question. Oh. Okay. Um, talking about the Pune Pact and Mahatma, I just want to say that 
at the 17th or the 18th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita describes the caste system extremely clearly. The only thing is that we should love to, we should love them. And, and it is described that everyone should do their own jobs. And we have to respect them and love them for it. I just wanted to tell the people that this has come from our scriptures only. It is not that we have created them. Um, I also wanted to just kind of, because you may not, mm, okay. So I was just wondering, as a person living in Europe at the minute, um, what issue of religion a social thing more than anything else. Um, when, when I talk about religion, when I get maybe discomfort about the fact that maybe I'm Hindu and people don't understand where I come from, it's very hard on, a, on that level for a large group of Hindus say, to be very hard for them, well for us obviously, um, for people to be responsible to us when we're discriminated against because it becomes purely a social issue. So in that kind of situation, it's difficult to communicate those feelings because it's social and it's not an institutional issue on some sense. So given that, how is, mm. and given that we've been talking purely about the issues in India and that the European system is the goal, why is that the goal? Because as a person there, when you say, oh, I'm a Hindu and people don't understand it, it's not, it's not something that I can go to my government and say, you know, I've been discriminated against because people don't understand me and they've treated me unfairly because it's not something that you do. It's not politically correct. It's not, people don't understand it. Sure, it's a lot more talked about. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very, uh, I think one has to, I, you know, I, I think I agree with, I mean, you put your finger on something which we ought to think much harder about. We, we don't really have a vocabulary. We, we, we have mantras. So even I have been pronouncing those mantras because I was describing what Nehru did in the Hindu court bill and so on and, and talking about secularism. But what is, I think what is needed is a conceptual vernacular, you know, I don't mean a natural language vernacular, I don't mean in, in vernacular languages, but I mean a conceptual vernacular which speaks to people, you know, speaks to you, say, as you say, because you declared yourself to be from the Hindu. And, and I think that's a real problem. There's a great tendency to just talk in this enlightenment vocabulary of rights. But the fact is that many, many people who don't have that vocabulary and just don't think in, in those frameworks have instinctive uh, commitments of the kind you're describing, you know, Hindus, and you have to tap them in a conceptual vernacular, right? I mean, uh, and and I think that's a very important part of politics, and uh, and I haven't addressed it here, and it's just a very important um, aspect of things. I suspect it's not something you you will ever get in classrooms, or in the media, or in in. Uh, 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 Certainly, professors and editorialists will never talk about it. Probably, these are the forms of public education that emerge in movements rather than informal uh, uh, sites. And movements, for that reason, are very important. Uh, I did say it was a last question, but if you have patience, I actually can see two more hands. Can you accommodate them? You don't mind. Yeah. Sir, my, my favorite subject in school was social studies. I have one question from that. Sir, what are your views on ideologies of Shahid Bhagat Singh? Because you have gone through ideologies of most of the prominent people. Because what I have learned is he gave up his religion because he thought people were fighting because of religion. When they were united against the fight against the, for the country, later on someone influenced them to fight amongst each other. So he thought he would be an example by giving up his religion. And sir, I was even going through your Wikipedia, so I need your views on athe atheism. 
and what is your definition of regionalism of regionalism okay sir okay sir third question is out of the <laughs> regionalism okay sir Uh, my question is with reference to your words about uh, ghar wapsi concept you said what is the ghar wapsi and uh, with reference to sanskrit as you said a uh, lot of religion a lot of languages have come out of sanskrit and it has not happened vice versa do you intend to say that even it has to happen with hinduism that maybe it has it should give way to other other religions or is there no, any no, meaning no 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 look what i said was that you see india has been a home to remarkable uh diversity of cultures coming from abroad even i mean just islam is not a, a, don't forget is is islam came to this country through persia central asia afghanistan and came here and at all at all levels it was it was it was uh forming a christians developing things in and and Islam in this country is is not at all like the Islam of and be, and because India has been a home to an Indo-Persian culture which is remarkable and and it's an indigenous culture in a way but indigenous not in the sense of native indigenous but but it is so in that sense there there is a real sense of ghar in in understanding what Indian civilization is but what I'm saying is that these people who are doing the conversion who are you know manipulating these conversions etc their conception of india is not at all the conception of akhar and i gave you uh, sanskrit as an example of the, the the so so my point is that they have no right to use the word khad because they are destroying the india which was home to a, 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 a okay i'm going to stop i'm please i i i i I don't know enough about you know from everything I've read about Bhagat Singh he was a remarkable figure and it is a great pity that he was uh, more peri- uh, peripheral than he should have been given how what a great figure he was and but I you know I I don't have an opinion on everybody and so I'd be happy to learn more about him in the future sir for the common people so it's very difficult to understand the jugglery of words regarding secularism or whatever it is and as the gentleman has told even as a childhood in my childhood i never felt any difference between the other communities like that but as i grew up i felt there is something which injustice is being done to majority in view of protecting the rights of minorities majority of the people feel it because the things have been done like that by the previous governments or whatever it is so that is uh, i am not able to understand uh, because even i am highly educated i have read the scriptures also still i feel there is something injustice has been done to the people so that is the reason why it has gone up like this the government have failed in controlling the other elements and as madam was telling some monks in the jains were converted same thing is happening in other that is not brought at any time that is a country here will be imprisoned but not the other people that type of feeling is there in among the all the majoritarianism that is the reason why this communal rights are increasing whatever it, or hindu fundamentalism is improve, increasing or whatever it, that is what i personally feel i personally do not have that i to read indian uh, scriptures etc sanskrit sir so where is the sanskrit talk has come there is no i mean implementation of sanskrit we have lost the study of sanskrit itself so where is difficult for Uh, the people to get uh, subjects into the sanskrit and while the sanskrit is respected by germany and other people so we are not able to do it and how how can any i mean uh, something which is good in other subjects can be translated into sanskrit if you do not know the sanskrit and the book uh, publishing etc has come only recently yes. all the sanskrit books were there in talapatras and all right. and who are the people who are studying the sanskrit that also has to be taken yeah Oh, yeah no why 
and uh, the, the urdu was there predominantly here because it was implemented even other people had to read urdu all the studies in urdu language even medicine was taught in urdu here in this state so that is where the state sponsors certain things